and um, we'll ask some of the speakers and um, have them um, try to answer the questions at that time. So today we're going to hear from um, a number of Forest Service folks. We're going to hear from Bob Deal, Nicholas Smith, and Jonas Epstein um, about integrating ecosystem services into Forest Service programs and operations. But before we get started, I'm just going to have a few announcements here, and then we'll get on to the presentation. So first, just wanted to note a few new papers and resources. So the um, National Ecosystem Services Partnership had an article published in Ecosystem Services about putting ecosystem services research into practice that might be of interest. In addition, there's a couple new resources. So there's a new federal resource from NOAA on green infrastructure effectiveness. Um, and there's also um, an updated um, version of the environmental valuation reference inventory that's been released by Environment and Climate Change Canada. Um, so both potentially useful resources for folks here um, on the phone. And then we also wanted to note our um, upcoming webinars. We're still working on scheduling this one, but we tentatively have one planned for December 8th. Um, with the Ford Stewardship Council to present on their um, new approach for incorporating ecosystem services into the forest certification process. Today's webinar and for previous webinars, the slides and the webinars are, um, are shared on our NEST website and they're all available um, at the link at the bottom of the screen here. And I just wanted to note a few upcoming events. Um, this one's coming soon, um, but if you have can get to London. This is an organization that has a lot of overlap with the National Ecosystem Services Partnership, but is working on a broader global scale to integrate um, cross-sector uh, solutions um, dealing with health development environment. And that's from the Bridge Collaborative. And then um, many of you are familiar with ACES, and they are already advertising for their 2018 conference, which I'm guessing early next year they'll start planning. So. Keep in mind that early December 2018. Okay, now I'm going to introduce the pre presenters. So we have Bob Deal, who is a research forester and science team leader for the U.S. Forest Service Pacific Northwest Research Station, and he's worked on ecosystem services for quite a while. Nicholas Smith works as an ecologist and ecosystem services specialist for the U.S. Forest Service in the Pacific Northwest, and has been working with NEST since uh, pretty much since the beginning. Um, and Jonas Epstein is an ORISE Economic Research Fellow with the U.S. Forest Service, serving as a, the National Forest System Office of Watershed, Fish, Wildlife, Air, and Rare Plants Ecosystem Services Point of Contact. So now I'm going to turn the presentation over to the speakers. So we'll just take a moment here to make sure we can get their slides up on the screen. Hey everyone, this is Nicholas Smith. Are you able to see the PowerPoint? Um, no, not yet. Are you sharing your screen? Or your application? There we go. There we go, yeah. Can you hear me as well? This is Bob Deal. Yes. yes. Okay, so I guess uh, I'm going to start with the first beginning of this. So, so again, thanks, Lydia, for the introduction. Um, this is my name is Bob Deal. I work with the research branch or the research deputy area of the Forest Service, and my two colleagues, uh, Nicholas Smith uh, and Jonas Epstein, both work for the National Forest System uh, deputy area. Nicola in Portland, Oregon, and Jonas Epstein in the Washington office. So, the three of us, among uh, several others on this this Nest uh, core team. Uh, meet uh, meet regularly and talk about um, how we we can work together with the agency to really to integrate this ecosystem services concept into our different parts of our, our forest service operations. So we're going to talk in some detail about about this report you see on the right, uh, which is called integrating ecosystem services in the, in the national forest service policy and operations. And uh, go to the next slide, Nicola. So uh, the next slide should be an outline of the talk today. I'm still waiting on the, on the next one. I, okay, there it is, yeah. So, so basically, um, 
I'm going to give a brief overview of how the, the Forest Service has been using this ecosystem services concept um, very briefly, and then talk about how this led to the development and chartering of this NEST group I just mentioned. Then we'll, go, we'll talk about this report in some detail. Um, Nichols will talk about planning and partnerships part of that, a big, those are both key parts there. And then Jonas will talk about the performance part of this and sort of the next steps where the where the NEST is evolving. And then I'm going to come back and, and sort of do a little synthesis at the end, what we think is the, the future directions of this, this NEST team. Go to the next slide, Nicole. So the Forest Service has been been involved with ecosystem services for, for many decades. Um, but it's been, you know, sort of under this multiple use concept, not you really really using the word or terminology of ecosystem services. But this concept has really been part of our, our agency for a while. It wasn't until probably, you know, five or six years ago that it started to get um, this ecosystem services concept became really um, important part of us and got um, encoded into the, the new Forest Service planning rule and then this presidential memorandum, the Forest Service had a, a really really detailed response to that. And then um, it led to, um, as well, the, the development of our, of our NEST team effort. And I'll talk a bit about how that, that evolved. So go to the next slide, Nicole. So again, um, the Forest Service has been involved in this um, using ecosystem services, but, but mostly in things like uh, the multiple use or multiple use and sustained yield act, which came out in 1960. And this, you know, also in things like the the uh, National Forest Management Act, which really uses um, multiple use as part of the agency. But it wasn't until um, the Forest Service planning rule in 2012 that we started to use this word ecosystem services in sort of our operations and planning. And then, again, I mentioned briefly the, the presidential memorandum came out in the, the last part of the Obama administration. That was an important agency document that directed all federal agencies to use this concept. So go to the next one. So, um, a little, and Nick will talk a little more about this later, but the, the planning rule was an important um, document for agency. And it, we use the words ecosystem services in a couple different ways. Um, it's connected with multiple use directly I think in the planning in the planning rules, probably 20 or 30 times you talk about ecosystem services and multiple use. But but if you go back to what what multiple use was, it really focused on five key resource elements: you know, timber, water, range, uh, fish, fish and wildlife habitat, and recreation. And anything else beyond that wasn't really included in our agency planning documents. So this was. A different concept, and it was a bit a bit of a challenge for the agency at first to to deal with all these potential ecosystem services that might be involved with forest plans or planning stuff. But and Nick, I think I'll mention this later. But um, one of the the key changes was in 2015, the directive said that it, that national forests um, should include what they called key K E Y ecosystem services in in forest plan revisions. The other really significant area of, of the planning rule was in this area called cultural heritage values. That's an important distinction and new for the agency. So go ahead. That's all I'm going to say about the planning rule. The other thing that, that came up there was on this um, presidential memorandum that came out in October 2015 where it directed all federal agencies to develop and institutionalize policies for both planning investment and regulatory context. So for instance, the Forest Service was, was more engaged in the planning part of that, but groups like the EPA and the Fish and Wildlife Service and maybe Army Corps of Engineers were more how they would deal with this ecosystem service conflict in a regulatory context. So they developed some different plans. I think the Forest Service put out a fairly detailed response to that. And the, the idea was to, which hasn't really happened yet, but maybe develop a, a, a community of practice concept that might work across federal agencies. And that's all we say about this. So let's let's go to the next slide. Yeah. So the other thing I'll mention is we did get involved in this concept um, with the the, um, the FREMS group, you know, projects that, that the uh, NESP has got involved with. And we had a couple of uh, case studies, the Marsh Project and the Cool Slaughter Project. Um, we also developed sort of the early efforts of developing this framework for ecosystem services and the Forest Service Programs operations, which really led into this more detailed report that we'll talk about it later on today. So go ahead, next slide. 
So I think it's worth spending a moment or two and talking about how the Nest team really developed. And I could kind of trace its roots back to an effort that was about five years ago where we called it an Ecosystem Services Champions Forum, where a bunch of, uh, it was a grassroots effort where a number of uh, practitioners working, um, including scientists working in research, included some line officers and staff from the National Forest System, and included some practitioners from state and private forestry. And they got together, and it was really apparent that the agency was doing a lot of work around this ecosystem services concept, but we weren't doing a very good job of communicating it, either within our deputy areas or certainly not across deputy areas. And so from this two-day um, workshop or forum, we developed a set of recommendations. And I won't go into this, but, but one of the key ones was to develop what we called an agency-wide ecosystem services framework for the Forest Service. Well, what we knew, knew ha that happened, we needed to get some buy-in and support from our, our, our uh, Washington office. So we got the, um, the group of we call associate deputy chiefs of the agency. They got together and, and met on our, our recommendations. And essentially what they said is that we really like what you're doing, but we don't want you to do another framework. We want you to basically write the policy for the agency. So it was a pretty, pretty strong a mandate, they said, and this led directly um, to the chartering of the National Ecosystem Strategy Team, or NEST. So it was chartered in 2013, and it was rechartered in 2016, and that's how this, this effort got started. Go ahead, next slide, Nicola. So there's a group, this is a, a, a cross-deputy group of, of people from research, people in National Forest System, people in state and private forestry, and we've been working, you know, we have weekly meetings and, um, and monthly webinars ourselves. We had a lot of effort. I, I, don't, I won't go into details of where we started to go with this, trying to develop policy, but it led to um, this NEST report. And I want to just mention, next slide, Nicola, next slide, the, the, the purpose or the mission of NEST is, is a really pretty powerful one. It's basically established to collaboratively develop national strategy and policy around ecosystem services and integrated into Forest Service programs and operations. And this led to the next slide, Nicola, which is this, um, this document here you see on the right. Um, we'll talk about that in some detail. By the way, if anyone wants to see a, a copy of this report, either an either a electronic copy or, or a hard copy, just um, let us know in the chat box and we'll try to get that to you. But this, this really, um, there's three kind of major parts of this. Um, one on decision making and analysis, second one on measurement, reporting, and communicating, and the third one is sort of the, this partnerships part. And I call this the sort of um, the three P's, if you will. So go to the next slide. And this is the last slide I think I'm going to do. Basically, so there's the P of planning, P of partnership, and P of performance. Basically looking at this broad suite of ecosystem services and decision making and priority setting, which really is our, our planning effort developing some work with our partnerships, and Nick will talk about this in some detail, and then how we actually report and communicate and quantify our work in terms of performance. And so I think I'm going to hand this off now to Nicola, who will start the next section. Hey, everyone. This is Nicola Smith. I uh, am an ecologist and ecosystem services specialist with the Forest Service based in the Pacific Northwest, and um, much of my program of work relates to um, applications of ecosystem services in forest planning as well as project level NEPA. Um, I work for state and private forestry as well and partnerships with utilities and others that benefit from um, working forest land. So I'll be covering the first two P's that Bob mentioned, um, planning and partnerships, and then Jonas will go into more detail about performance. So. Um, Due to limited time, I'll primarily be focusing on forest planning. I'll then touch on how we are um, addressing ecosystem services and project level NEPA, as well as opportunities to work with states and um, set priorities for our national program. So as many of you know, uh, as Bob just mentioned, um, it was really exciting for many of us in the agency to see ecosystem services be explicitly included in our 2012 land management planning rule, which guides um, forest level planning, mostly high level guidance, guidance on land management designations, 
and forest plans that are established every 10 to 15 years or so. And so, um, as Bob mentioned as well, there was some concern when the planning rule was first established that, you know, what would it mean to manage for ecosystem services on national forest system lands because there are so many. And so um, criteria were established to give some focus to this analysis. So um, forests are asked to address key ecosystem services and forest planning. So obviously an ecosystem services service that's contributed by the plan area or the national forest um, to identify the geographic scale of that benefit. So is that accruing to a local community, a county? You know, when it comes to carbon, are we talking about ecoregions or global contributions? What is the condition and trend of that contribution? Is it stable? Is it facing um, threats due to um, climate change or other um, land use change in adjacent lands? Um, what are the drivers, such as population growth, that might be affecting future demand and availability? Um, how stable is the system, both ecologically and socially? And what's happening across our boundaries? Um, what do we need to account for in terms of private forest conditions, state or tribal land, so that we really understand the function of coherent landscapes? So this just gives you a snapshot of some of the ecosystem services that have been identified to date by um, those forests in the agency that we call early adopters or who have applied the 2012 planning rule to forest planning. Um, also, Chris Miller, who's part of the National Ecosystem Services Strategy Team, asked me to just mentioned that we wrote a case study on forest planning for the Federal Resource Management and Ecosystem Services um, guidebook effort, and that came out before um, many lessons learned um, came forward from our early adopters. So I appreciate Lydia giving this opportunity to, to share what we've learned since the Frames Guide was published. So essentially, in a nutshell, what we're trying to address through forest planning is, you know, seeing the forest in a broader landscape, um, making conditions between um, ecological context and goods and services, thinking about what we do on the land and what our neighbors do on the land um, that has a bearing on the benefits that we provide. And then also through forest planning, we're asked to address social and economic sustainability. So thinking about jobs, public health, um, quality of life, and education. So a quick example, um, some early adopters of the 2012 planning rule include the Inyo, Sequoia, and Sierra National Forests in California. And I'll just go into a bit more detail about um, water-related ecosystem services that they addressed. So in their assessment phase of plan revision, they we're interested in understanding the capacity of the national forest to provide, you know, water storage and flood protection um, assets for municipalities in terms of drinking water and water for irrigation, as well as the quality of the water that was being provided by the national forest. And so, in addition to understanding the capacity of the landscape to provide those services, what were some stressors or risks that the Forest Service needed to address in terms of climate change, development on adjacent lands, um, shifts and disturbances that we're trying to address, as well as impaired water bodies that are listed that we need to improve water quality function. So thinking about the capacity for, for providing a benefit, but also stressors that we need to keep on our radar, both on our lands and off our lands. And so, for example, um, this team pulled together, you know, several attributes that pertain to water supply, um, water storage, you know, water runoff, um, groundwater basins, you know, meadows, both in terms of water storage and water quality improvements, and just assembled these together to do a, to be able to do a spatial analysis of ecosystem services related to water supply. And in addition to these individual ecosystem service mapping efforts, the team also did a composite map of various ecosystem services that are being provided, places where um, stressors are a concern, to try to bring some priority and focus to management of ecosystem services, both collectively and individually on the landscape. So where, what kind of data can we use to get at these questions? And Jonas is going to address this as well. So increasingly, we're looking at spatial data sets that um, can help us understand ecosystem service provision and threats 
across ownership. So many of you are familiar with the Forest Service Forest Faucets Project, looking at forests in terms of drinking water importance, but also threats that they face in a spatially explicit fashion. Um, Charlie Luz from our Rocky Mountain Research Station has done some really helpful work for us in understanding the contributions that national forests make to stream flow to help us understand our niche in the broader landscape in terms of who we benefit and how, how much our beneficiaries rely on us specifically to provide a certain ecosystem service, in this case, um, drinking water and water supply. So um, I know there's a lot of text on this slide. This just gives you a sense of indicators um, that our folks in the Sierra and California use to get at other ecosystem services. So as Jonas is going to mention, one thing that we're trying to wrap our minds around is how can we in the agency both collect and organize information that can actually help us indicate ecosystem service delivery and um, sustainable supply over time. So from policy to practice, you know, I, what, one of the, the works that I cite a lot from, from the FRAMES effort is Dinah Baer's analysis of the National Environmental Policy Act and where does ecosystem services fit within that. And so part of what uh, we and the agency are trying to explore is that, you know, there's um, ecosystem services in our formal guidance for forest level planning, but how about project level NEPA where we're actually making um, management decisions that affect the landscape. And so, you know, I know a lot of us live and breathe NEPA, but this is a little schematic just illustrating the different phases of the NEPA process. And to date, we have found that the proposal development phase of NEPA where we really try to understand the function of the landscape, what do our stakeholders expect of us? Um, how do values relate to ecological conditions? That seems to be a good fit for introducing ecosystem services into the NEPA process. So, you know, some Forest Service specialists have expressed concern that, you know, if we convene um, workshops early on in NEPA and folks share, um, you know, the values that, that they have for the land or benefits that they receive from the land, does that, you know, is that a comprehensive list? Is it a representative list? Does it mean that all of those ecosystem services carry equal weight? And so what we're trying to do through, um, through the NEPA process is bring um, members of the public, um, subject matter experts from other agencies, from academic institutions, um, so that there's a two-way exchange of information about what do the natural sciences tell us about the function of these landscapes, um, what do people value, and, and how can we use ecological information to help make connections between a need for management or not and sustaining these benefits over time. So you know, I think a lot of us in the federal government are, are struggling right now with capacity. So we can't do everything everywhere. So how can we use ecology and the natural sciences to un help us understand what is the niche of a particular landscape, what very unique um, function does it serve, what is quote unquote fair to expect of a particular watershed or, or planning area, so that we're not um, trying to manage for all ecosystem services everywhere, but really try to link our management to the function of the land. So um, there's a lot more um, specific examples about how we've addressed Project Level NEPA in the FRAMES um, uh, agency examples page, which is a great resource. So I, I'm, I invite you to um, see our case studies there, and I'm happy to follow up with folks as well. So very briefly, I'll just mention um, how we are working with states. So under the U.S. Farm Bill, um, states are required to look at um, forest management strategies off of federal lands as well with, with three primary goals of preserving working forest lands, protecting forests from harm, and then explicitly enhancing public benefits from trees and forests. And so the, ways that, the way that we engage with states um, varies de depending upon the priorities in their action plans. For example, uh, the state of Washington has been quite active in recognizing the importance and potential of ecosystem services um, markets and payment programs to highlight the value of working forest lands. And we, we've been involved in supporting those pilots um, in terms of infrastructure and metrics in Washington state. The South has 
and taken a really impressive leadership role in starting to quantify the benefits provided by urban forests, um, also, you know, work privately on working forest lands and state lands. So this is just a couple of examples here of evaluation of air quality improvements in Tennessee from urban forests, um, looking at the importance of the forest industry in the state of Georgia. So, um, you know, we're recognizing that the Southern Group of State Foresters is really taking some leadership here and how can we help standardize some of these evaluations so that there is coherent assessments going on in the South, but also, you know, how can we similarly assess ecosystem services provided by federal lands in these landscapes? Um, so just a couple more thoughts before I hand it over to Jonas. Um, what we're trying to think about is how can we apply ecosystem services analysis, not only to forest planning and project level planning, but our national level programs. So where should we set priorities? Um, and how can we articulate the benefits that the public receives from our programs, particularly in this resource constrained environment? Um, finally, how can identifying these benefits help us reach out to partners to you know, think collaboratively across landscapes and both bring more resources to um, stewardship of the federal lands, but also building ecosystem services markets and incentive programs to sustain working forest lands. So for example, you know, many of you are familiar with ways in which we partner with water utilities. So NGOs and universities can help us really nail down the economic benefit and return on investment um, for restoration. So, for example, um, EcoTrust and Earth Economics helped us and the Eugene Water Electric Board determine that um, riparian forest conservation and restoration in Eugene's municipal watershed has a 260% return on investment over 20 years. So those kinds of stories can really help us sustain these partnerships and bring more resources um, to um, forest conservation in municipal watersheds and elsewhere. Um, also looking to the private sector. So um, my Pacific Northwest friends know that beer is a big part of the culture. It's a big part of the identity of the Pacific Northwest. So in Oregon, through the Nature Conservancy and others, we're starting to build brew shed alliances where you know we're, we're partnering with breweries, other beverage bottle, bottling companies, um, the out, outdoor suppliers, outfitters and guides that rely upon critical input from forest lands. So Good Life Brewing, for example, in um, Bend, Oregon, relies upon water that flows from the Deschutes National Forest. So they've developed a product that both provides education about that linkage on the right, which is a snapshot from the back of their brew shed ale, and help bring proceeds to um, stewardship of those forest lands. Um, I, I would say that one of the newest efforts um, for the agency is trying to understand and um, capitalize upon conservation finance opportunity. So Tommy Herbert in our DC office is with our ecosystem services and market staff and is, is now our conservation finance program lead. So how can partners like Encourage Capital and World, Re World Resources Institute, among others, help us um, understand how to partner with the private sector, which is increasingly interested in these investments, um, to, to bring um, cross-sector um, funds to stewardship of forests. Um, so now I will hand it over to Jonas, who will be talking about the performance elements of our GTR. Thanks, Nicola. <clears throat> um, so I guess the, the third component here in terms of how we're characterizing our opportunities is um, really the quantifying and communicating the value of resources and impacts of our management actions in terms of benefits to people. Um, obviously, there's a direct tie to our land management planning and project evaluation efforts, um, but also even in terms of partnerships. Uh, if you want to guarantee market certainty over the long run, uh, you need to identify indicators that work both for the Forest Service in terms of uh, how we quantify success, um, but ensure that they're transparent uh, replicable and and uh, our private sector partners are comfortable with with them as well in terms of demonstrating uh, return on investment over time. 
In terms of how we're viewing performance, there are three main components. Uh, there's national reporting and assessments, uh, traditional performance management, and then inventory monitoring and assessment. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so in terms of performance reporting, uh, this is really a huge issue uh, for our agency. You know, I think a lot of federal land management agencies have long discussed the need to move from outputs to outcomes. Our mantra has always been, uh, you know, once you've treated it, you've done it. Uh, but this doesn't really account for trade-offs, opportunity costs, impacts to dependent communities, uh, benefits in terms of avoided cost, or resiliency over time. And then also in our, in our uh, 2012 forest plan, uh, we need to be able to incorporate these types of indicators into plan monitoring over time. Um, and so in many cases, it's really developing proof of concepts. Uh, can we develop a suite of metrics around uh, watershed and aquatic restoration uh, that we can use and, and in which contexts? Um, at a national level, there's a balance between having indicators that are broad enough to be nationally rolled up and, and aggregated uh, and consistent but still reflective of these unique uh, environmental situations. One effort that our agency is undertaking right now, as you'll see on the left, is going through our strategic plan um, goal by goal. And for each of those strategic objectives, uh, really defining what the outcomes are over time, uh, what capacity do we have to measure them, uh, what annual widgets or outputs can we track and, and how do they contribute to broader, uh, either midterm or long-term goals that really that really indicate change on the landscape over time. Um, and that's just the example that Nicola pointed out earlier from forest to faucets, uh, with the realization that uh, we do have some degree of control over how we're improving uh, and maintaining healthy and resilient forests and how that supports uh, both water quantity and quality over time, which is our strategic objective D, provide abundant clean water. Uh, next slide, please. So again, this is this is the this is the real struggle. Uh, how, how do we quantify qualitative change with the same level of academic rigor as as quantitative changes? Um, how do you weigh? How do you incorporate weighting uh, for monetary and non-monetary values? Um, we're getting closer. Uh, we have a watershed condition framework that's, a, I believe, a ripe opportunity to characterize watershed condition uh, across all national forests based on 12 biotic and abiotic indicators, um, but it's not really, it, it's, it's subjective and, and um, while it's a framework, I think that there are ways to incorporate ecosystem services in terms of how we then prioritize those projects uh, and those watershed restoration action plans. And indeed, that's, that's kind of the next phase of the watershed condition framework uh, is being able to identify and, and bring criteria to bear to make it a more transparent effort in terms of prioritizing these watershed restoration projects and also evaluating it for success over time. Next slide, please. Uh, so that was just a sampling of some of the performance metrics issues that we're wading through. Um, I'll, I'll bring another example up uh, as we go through these slides, but uh, essentially in terms of the summary of opportunities, uh, we really feel that ecosystem services science can help us analyze trade-offs between management decisions um, and, and continue to plan for public benefits at the landscape scale. The tools and methodologies piece is essential for helping us quantify and communicate. Um, and by this focus on shared or aligned values over time, uh, you can build consensus, you can catalyze partnerships, and you can bolster support. Um, and expand beyond your traditional cons constituencies to, to share in our agency's mission. Next slide, please. And so from there, uh, the next phase of this GTR was really doing some data collection and having conversations with the different program specialists and trying to really pinpoint, you know, moving towards how we actualize on these opportunities. Uh, how are we characterizing our needs? And, and you'll see that with these common needs that we've identified, they're not necessarily mutually exclusive. Oftentimes what's a communication issue is, is also a policy issue, um, hence the cycle. Uh, but just to touch on a few, um, in terms of resource capacity, those issues could, that we identified were mostly around 
staffing uh, and the resource, resource constraints that we have there. Um, you know, reference materials, do we have a compendium of information that we can draw from across this broadly decentralized agency? Um, is, it, is it a funding issue? Uh, in terms of data integration and management, it could just be having consistent databases that, that share similar metrics. Uh, we have three different invasive species databases uh, that national forests can use to report on accomplishments over time, for example. Uh, valuation tools, how, how is valuation being used? Uh, a lot of people seem to misconstrue economic benefit and economic impact. Uh, one is not the other. Market, ac market transactions and activity aren't necessarily a, a, a good indicator of well-being over time. So uh, how do you reconcile the two and, and what sorts of valuation uh, standards and, and methodologies can we apply and in which contexts? Um, and then the research need as well. Uh, we, we seem to center on research needs around um, ecological production functions, valuation technology, or sorry, uh, valuation innovation, and um, uh, blanking on the third. Um, I think it was qualitative analysis as well and holding that to the same level of scientific rigor as quantitative analysis. And then finally, the policy guidance question. Um, sometimes it comes down to leadership intent, depending on where you are. Um, our California regional office is, is a strong leader in ecosystem services because it's explicitly embedded into their uh, ecological restoration framework for the future, and they work closely with the state to implement that. Uh, so part of this paper was also looking at where we already have policies and authorities and mandates in place and whether it's a question of strengthening existing policies versus clarifying where there might be confusion or where we might be able to apply valuation, uh, for example, in NEPA planning, or whether we have the, the authority to collect uh, funds for restoration on public lands in the context of environmental markets, or it could be clarifying or even identifying where there are gaps in policy to begin with. Next slide, please. Um, so this is just a quick diagram, and it's, it's included in the report, but essentially we broke down those opportunity components uh, based on where the needs, we saw the needs were. And, and as you'll see, many of them are cross-cutting, which uh, we think is a good thing because if you can hone in on, on one aspect, like really being intentional about what databases you're using to store information and having standardized criteria about how that information gets reported, uh, you can identify or you can help uh, support two or three of these other problems, like um, monitoring or, or, or aligning quantitative models. Next slide, please. Uh, Nicola, can you move to the next slide, please? Yes, I moved to join us. Is there a delay? I'm wondering uh, if there might be okay. a delay. Oh, we're good. We're okay. Good. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> got it. So essentially this brings us to the present. Uh, the, this report we viewed as kind of a roadmap envisioning where we see ecosystem services uh, framing opportunities for the agency given our authorities and given the vast diversity of programs and funds that we administer. Um, but that's not to say that there haven't been some changes, uh, especially immediately after we published this report. Um, so I wanted to point us to a couple of political buzzwords that I've heard flying around, especially here in the Washington office, um, and how ecosystem services may or may not have a significant impact in those decisions. Uh, the first is around trade-offs, decision-making, and regulatory streamlining. So here, uh, a lot of federal land management agencies are being asked to uh, do a, a pretty thorough regulatory review. We're being asked to expedite our decision-making, permitting, um, increase access, uh, revisit our categorical exclusions for wildfire prevention projects, uh, streamline transportation permitting, et cetera. And so how do you do that when oftentimes doing an ecosystem services analysis up front might require more time uh, and more assessment? Uh, and so it's a balance. Uh, the way that we've tried to justify it is uh, you need to have that uh, a good public participatory process where everybody's inclusive of those values at the onset, 
because if not, uh, you get litigated more off the back end. And uh, in time, the way that our federal agency works, if you get litigated enough times, people start to lose trust and you begin to work in a more constrained decision-making space. Um, as Nicola mentioned, conservation finance and market-based solutions are really uh, burgeoning, especially given the fact that we have to leverage more with less. Uh, wildfire eats up over 50% of our uh, budget as of now. So really looking to our partner organizations and really trying to harness those benefits and quantify them in terms of um, actual returns on investment, whether it's avoided cost for water quality treatment or uh, a pay for performance bond where an investor is getting a payback over a, a specified time period for a uh, restoration project. Um, we're also working with uh, organizations and even, and even companies are beginning to, to champion these messages for us like Coca-Cola who are doing a lot of water replenishment work and really trying to, to get more, to think more broadly about metrics, which is um, the next touch point here. And again, trying to quantify those outcomes uh, most recently, we've been developing these watershed outcomes and potential monitoring mechanisms that we have and trying to determine whether we can characterize these in a way that work both for Forest Service watershed restoration evaluation, but also for uh, corporate sustainability and investments. When people come to the forest to invest in us, how do we ensure that they're getting what they want um, without compromising our multiple use mission? And there's also, I should add, a focus on social indicators as well, uh, that it's not, I mean, it is about the ecological outcomes, but what sort of social impact are we having on these communities through stewardship contracting, through putting people to work, through job training opportunities, and how are we adapting to changing demographics? Um, economic valuation has kind of come to the forefront again, especially in this administration when people are asking what the economic benefits of the federal estate are. Uh, and so we're engaged in some natural capital work as well, uh, working cross deputy with and, and cross agency with uh, Ken Bagstad and the folks from USGS to really think about these comprehensive uh, environmental accounts for land and water, biodiversity and recreation, and, and thinking about how we can connect those directly to industrial outputs to kind of almost redefine how we think about well being over time and link that to our UN sustainable development indicators. And then finally, just communications and messaging. As a highly decentralized agency, um, the needs are going to be different depending on where you are. So what does ecosystem services mean to a planner? How that might be different to a, a fire specialist or to a, uh, a NEPA writer? And how do we ensure that we have consistent messaging when we're doing our public outreach and trying to get uh, our general population and, and the, the kids that come to the Forest Service to engage in fishing derby days to really understand how ecological functionality is improving their lives. Next slide, please. And so basically, John, if I, you know. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no go ahead, Nicola. Oh, no, it's okay. I just wanted to let you know there seem, does seem to be a, a delay with the slides. So feel yeah, free to continue I'm, your thoughts, and hopefully the slides will catch up with you. <laughs> okay, yes. good. Um, I would just mention now that you know these topics are really at the forefront of our minds and we developed our action plan over the summer um, and we can send around that action plan after the call but but given these needs and given the limited capacity and the perspective in the WO and, and the, the highly varied demands of each region and each forest um, our thinking was how can we start to put the wheels in motion I think I think generally across the agency people get it uh, but but how can how can they apply these these tools, these concepts in a, in a constrained environment. So our action items are mostly focused on uh, content and outreach. Uh, it's, it's making information relatable and accessible. It's working with willing regions to meet the needs of both the agency, but most importantly, the people that we serve. Um, and it's not so much, it's not so much dictating which tools we can, we can, we, we have to use or, or standardize. Um, but really just documenting their applicability, making them transparent, um, and making them uh, useful given the context. So our first area of focus here was in continuing to facility, facilitate a community of practice similar to what we're doing today. Um, that could be capacity mapping to continually, we're looking to identify points of contact at the region or forest level that bring a different perspective to the table. Uh, 
we, we're working on developing a compendium of these resources, um, kind of a chat board where people can talk and, and answer questions, but also look at case studies, look at uh, how ecosystem services is already uh, written into our legislative authorities. Um, and it's also projects too. It's conceptualizing and having a place where people can share what projects are being worked on across the country and, and connect with those points of contact. Um, we've talked about the idea of developing internal training materials for different folks. Um, for example, how to do a, a trade-off analysis um, based on public values around water um, and, and actually walking through a formalized uh, hour, hour and a half certification program for Forest Service employees to better understand valuation and, and ecosystem services in, a, in an explicit decision-making context. And then it's building upon this uh, agency foundation for natural capital. We have lots of national reports and it's trying to make sure that we are communicating a consistent message when we roll this information up. Next slide, please. Um, it'll come up, but we can't do this without strategic leadership engagement continually. Uh, and this is just things like developing information for program areas when an ask comes in. It's regular issue-driven engagement, uh, whether it's an issue on the pipeline or um, more expedited decision-making to reduce wildfire risk, to uh, FERC relicensing and how do you ensure that um, there are proper mitigation measures in place, to sage-grouse habitat and how do you run a, a functional uh, sage-grouse mitigation plan, and how do you take into account those resource values. Next slide, please. Uh, another major area of emphasis for us is around agency communications. We're developing what we're calling nature's benefits narratives. This is actually promulgated out of California, uh, but essentially trying to break down those key ecosystem services in terms of what we actually provide as, as an agency uh, around things like water, air, public health, fish and wildlife, et cetera. Uh, try and provide what the context is uh, how the forest provides for those services, uh, internal economic statistics, external talking points for a public outreach officer to use or a NEPA specialist, uh, case studies, questions and answers. And so we've been developing these, this content, these packages, right? And uh, we'd like to put them online, but we're also making them internally available. And they can be individually tailored based on the needs of the region that's using them. Uh, we're also using this to leverage some work that some economists in our agencies are doing around forest benefits at a glance. Essentially, it's a, a completely publicly accessible web portal that generates these automated economic benefit reports from a forest level, aggregated up through a regional level to a national level. Um, and so we'd like to characterize those reports and break them down individually by each of these services, just as a communications tool. So we can generate these reports every year in a consistent way to ensure that we're giving the decision makers and, and leadership and Congress and whoever, whoever else is asking for this information um, a correct and consistent answer. Um, we've been working to develop a communications framework that tiers to regional plans and we're also redesigning our website, which is terribly outdated right now. Next slide, please. Um, Market-based solutions, you're, you're seeing more and more of these avoided cost analyses, which oftentimes is a key catalyst for payments for watershed services by a utility. Uh, so we're increasingly trying to make these case studies more well-known. We recently put together a Watershed Investment Partnership Toolkit, or Diagnostic, which essentially is meant for land managers, but it leverages um, the best available science and uh, water fund information to date to really walk the user through, depending on where you are in the process, um, what does it take to be able to promulgate a Watershed Investment Partnership or fund? What type of mechanisms do we have at our disposals, whether it's through grants and agreements or a potential forest resilience bond? Um, how do you do the pre-feasibility analysis? How do you make sure you have the right stakeholders at the table, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, again, we've developed a lot of content trying to figure out how to package that in, a, in an accessible way for our field units. Next slide, please. Um, 
And again, here's an example of a forest resilience bond, um, which is the conservation finance angle, um, really providing proof of concept just through pilot projects. Um, that's kind of the approach we've taken. Uh, it, it's really hard to get people financially literate on these bonds, so we're trying to lead by example, work directly with uh, nat eager and willing national forests and regions to um, pilot test the feasibility of these bonds. And essentially when questions come up, we work with the Office of General Counsel and the lawyers and try and maintain and clarify where we have uh, the legislative authority to implement some of these projects. So it's constantly evolving. Next slide. And finally, we're trying to um, implement different metrics. This is all about uh, streamlining our accomplishment reporting and our databases. So traditionally, our National Fisheries and Aquatics Program has only reported uh, accountability and success through two metrics at year end, um, acres of lake acres enhanced and stream miles treated. So we're working to see, you know, what, what type of information do we collect how does the fisheries program define success? Um, and can we streamline our databases to be a little bit more inclusive of social and economic values as well? And how do we report that spatially? So looking at things like avoided cost for invasive species management, uh, avoided costs for aquatic organism passage and road culvert replacements, but also social outreach and education too. Um, so hopefully being able to promulgate some uh, social media analytics to determine how we're changing, we're adapting to changing demographics over time. For all of our efforts in doing outreach, who's actually coming to the Forest Service and what kind of impact is that making and can we map it? And so this is a pilot project that's currently in development on 13 national forests, but we're hoping we can develop a third spatial layer around mitigation in the future. And finally, sharing best practices. Uh, some of you might have seen this. This was promulgated by our USDA Office of Environmental Markets but it's an ecosystem services assessment uh, web portal. And it basically just lists out the different assessment or quantification or valuation tools. It lists who sponsors it, what type of ecosystem services you're looking for. And it's essentially a quick filter that allows the user to, to decipher um, based on their project decision space or context, um, what they have at their disposal to be able to quantify some of these values or these services. And so that's in beta right now, but we're hoping to get that on our, on our newly designed website. So essentially that, that's all I have in terms of um, action items. I guess I'll, I'll turn it back to Bob for um, okay. how he sure. envisions Thanks, moving Jonas. forward. Yep. Yeah, um, so this very quickly. So um, you've heard quite a bit about existing national policy for the agency on using Ecosystem services. You heard about you know national forest planning. You've heard about uh, how we we do performance and partnerships working at national scale. But we see the nest effort now evolving, and that in other words, we need to get this work out into the field and working with uh, different regions of the Forest Service, diff different national forests, and how we might actually um, implement these projects at a project scale. So I think we, we're we're sort of uh, unsure how this is going to go. Joanna spent to some training documents and uh, some di different webinars, but but it, well, we see the Nest team really evolving from a from a national uh, Washington office focus to uh, things out in the field. So I'm going to give you a few quick examples of how this is being applied out in California, Region Five. So they're sort of using the same sort of a, a layout of you know the three P's there, having a coordinate integration of these benefits, how they quantify and communicate at a at a regional level. Um, and how they connect providers and beneficiaries of, of these these services. So, next slide, Mika, Nicola. So, but basically, uh, we, you know, it's really important that we actually help folks um, to implement this work out out in uh, forest and, and project scales. So, go ahead and still wait for the next slide. Um, okay. So, example on Region Five, they have this area on. Um, oops, you went to thing two here, but. Um, uh, one example is standardizing tools, okay, regional leadership. So basically there's a, a group there of dedicated staff that's actually trying to get this work done at a regional scale, working with their forest planners, working with their 
the regional services groups. Go ahead, next slide, then, Nicola. Um, and how example of a couple examples of both water and carbon, how they're using that. Um, I wait to get the next slide up. Yeah, Bob, there's a significant delay, so I encourage you in the interest of time to keep on keeping on. Okay, so so a couple examples of how this is being done, both in terms of key resources of, of water and carbon. Um, so I'm still waiting here on the next one. But basically, you know, those are a couple of really important things. Obviously, California's fire is a real big issue right now, too. But basically, quantifying this in terms of, of how they're using water in the air. So, so for instance, 50% of California's water supply comes from national forests. This is a really big deal. So they want to see, you know, not just the forest to foster this work, but how, how it's being, um, how water supply is being uh, crude and how it's being used. So and the, another example is California has a, a carbon, you know, cap and trade program, basically. Um, so they're using that, um, how, how national forests can be applied and use this concept as well. But then just a couple more slides here. Um, let me see this. So basically, um, what's all this good? So they they're using this concept of, as Jones mentioned, this nature's benefits. Um, instead of using ecosystem services, they're using the word nature's benefits. Uh, you know, there's uh, some good advantages to that as well. But basically, um, to coordinate both with ongoing projects and to use this, you know, we don't get directly involved with markets, but use how the forces can help support existing markets and how they work on things like upstream and downstream financing mechanisms for that as well. 